Good morning, West USA. Welcome to another edition of our Tuesday morning webinar where we're here each and every week to help you increase your bottom line Why we increase our bottom ends here. <laughs> it's a glorious week here. I mean, there it happened. We, we've all seen the movie Christmas Vacation where the Griswolds are marching through the, the, the snow in search of their Griswold family Christmas tree. And there it is with the lights shining down from heaven and the angels are singing. Well, I had a similar experience this week when I went to the grocery store and their little Girl Scouts were selling Thin Mints. And uh, so that's a beautiful week. So my freezer is full and stocked, but that's not why we're here. We're here to uh, learn more about how to be more productive in real estate. And as always, if you have any questions about any of our materials or questions about the slides, please feel free to email us at webinar at westusa.com. A little snippet of what we got going on today. Of course, we have uh, Mr. Todd Menard here to give us a look at the real estate numbers. Uh, and Mick Menard is here from Home Street. Uh, he says he's got some news today, some big news, right? Big news. Big, big, big news. <laughs> so I'm looking forward to that. He asked if I read the news today, and I hadn't yet, gotten, hadn't gotten around to it yet. Going to give you a little three-pack on uh, – it's actually going to be a four-pack, four questions – uh, that you should ask about every single marketing piece uh, that goes out. And then, of course, we've got Legal Hotline's Jesse Walnick here. going to talk about the revised purchase contract. I'm emphasizing the term revised rather than new, uh, but some very important stuff because February 1st, it's rolling out whether you like it or not. And then, of course, don't do that with Bob. All right, Todd, uh, let's, uh, let's get into the weekly stats and what is going on in the real estate market here in the Valley of the Surface of the Sun. Well, there's a couple of anomalies uh, in what's taking place, but let's just take a look at the dashboard first. We have closed is averaging 70 days on market. Uh, month supply is sitting at 3.93, just under four, of course. Absorption rates up to 25.46. And our average list price is still hovering above 500,000, coming up at 509,173. I don't know where all those expensive properties are coming from, Mike, but uh, good thing is the average sale price is still hovering in that 260 to 275 range. We're at 269.013. And list price to sale price retention, the sellers aren't giving up too much, about 2.5% of the list price uh, in the negotiation. Remember, that doesn't include concessions on page two. So taking a look at inventory and across the board, we're sitting at uh, just over 20,000 units. And again, we've been creeping up there about, you know, maybe 150 to 200 units per week difference. Um, and that's good because that's more inventory in the market, more selection for our buyers. Pending is sitting at 4817. Boy, did that jump up fast uh, from the holiday market and closed units already at 5,005. We're almost, you know, Mike, today's the last day of the month, but you know, it never fails. Last day of the month, that's when most of the closings come in. We finished about 7,000 at the end of last month. So we're really hoping that uh, today's a very, very busy day across the valley for closings. Taking a look at uh, new listings, we uh, 2,179 new listings were taken this past week. Uh, that is up also 2.9%, just short of 3%. Days on market, uh, active is about 131. So that's good. That's uh, fluctuating just a little bit. A little, It's up a little higher, which isn't overall good, but it's down overall and closed inventory still sitting at 70 days on market. And again, that's that's a good thing. We want to see that somewhere between, you know, 60 to 75 days. That's a, that's a good sweet spot of the bat. And the price range is down here for those of you. You can look if you have a seller that you're going to go talk to and your price range falls uh, or your list price falls within this price range or looking for buyers. This is just some good handy information for you uh, as you are the expert in the industry. So well, the spreadsheet takes a look at this. It also compares uh, the current week and it also compares over the last couple of months, as you know, but for you new listeners. Um, so 2175, uh, 2179 last week was 2117. Uh, we need to keep that. Those are some good numbers because if you if you take two thousand, you're going to be back up in the seven eight thousand new listings range as we were like in November. You can see December was down to about sixty four hundred. Active inventory. How does it affect that? You just take a look at the analogy for yourself when you have a moment. Uh, but you'll see that we are just barely up uh, from last week. Uh, and again, uh, you know, we're we'll get out there and take some more listings because to the victor goes the spoils. If you've got listings. That's almost a guaranteed sell. It's location, 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 and price and condition. Taking a look at pending, uh, 4817, 40, 
seven last week. Look out your eyes across December was at 39. So again, uh, this is good news for those of you out there that actually people are actually writing and going into escrow on those properties. And how does it turn out? Well, we talked about 5,000 clo uh, closed month to date. Uh, last year, we were at 51 35. So we're trailing last year just a little bit. Uh, but this is the first week we've reported trailing. La last couple of weeks, we've been ahead of the game. Sliding your eyes across. Yeah, we need to be back in that seven, 8,000 closing range. And I think, you know what? Let's take a look. Keep our fingers crossed, see what happens next week when we take a look at the numbers. Uh, finally, looking at the bottom of the page under the statistics. Again, how do you use this stuff? You know, four months supply, four to six months when you're talking to your clients, either buyers or sellers. You know, four to six months is a neutral market. Uh, again, it's one of those things. If you write the contract right, your buyers are have that prequal letter. They're all ready to go. They've done their homework. You've set their expectations. It should be a good sale for you, and they should get the property at a fair price. From a seller's perspective, almost the identical same thing. Um, you know, you just need to make sure that property looks good. So when you're under four, uh, you're in a buyer a seller's market. When you're over six, you're in a seller's market. Uh, Yes, I said that correctly. So anyway, uh, going down to the next line, average list price, average sale price. Again, uh, we were last week over 300 for sales price. But, uh, you know, it fluctuates back and forth, back and forth, ebbs and flows. Uh, we started last year at about 265. We finished at about 280. So there was about a $15,000. Uh, dollar price uh, appreciation year over year. So take a look at these numbers. Uh, you know, you've got your, uh, you know, average days on market here as you need. We don't really have a need to talk about any more about those today. So Mike, that's pretty much a, a snapshot of what's going on in the marketplace. All right. And they'll be on the dashboard. And, and I want to just, at the end of the day, with all the numbers, be equipped, be knowledgeable, know what's going on in the market and get out there and talk to people. Uh, speaking of Girl Scout cookies, I was just speaking with one of our agents who's a father selling Girl Scout cookies with um, his daughter and uh, over the weekend and got two buyer leads out of it just because he opened up the discussion. And I'll say this also about Girl Scout cookies. We, we all know Thin Mints are the best, but I will say this because there's so much turmoil in this country. Everybody's really upset. People are threatening to leave the country. If you don't freeze Thin Mints, you should denounce your U.S. citizenship right on the spot. So, uh, <laughs> so <laughs> moving right along. Uh, so let's see how this equates to um, uh, what's going on in the mortgage industry. We've got Mick Bernard here from the Bookspan Baker team at Home Street Home Loans. And I got to tell you, uh, last week I was over there at your Phoenix regional headquarters there in the Biltmore area. And uh, not only what a wonderful facility, you know, if we're looking to meet clients and so forth, but you got one of those built on built in hard water line Keurig machines uh, and a <laughs> an array of K cups loved it. Yeah, very nice, very nice. Well, there's a lot of people. We got to keep the underwriters happy, right? And the funders make sure that they're uh, <laughs> working overtime, getting all of our stuff done, done on on schedule. Nothing exciting about interest rates. They're hanging in there at an eighth up one week, an eighth down. They're probably slightly better this week. Keep in mind that the rates you see in front of you are quoted without points. A lot of lenders advertise them with points, so you can still get an FHA VA under four if your client's willing to pay a discount point to be able to to do that. Um, Today, I wanted to touch base on the down payment assistance programs. As we've showed this slide in the past, but the next slide is going to be different. You know, there's a home in five, there's a home plus. Uh, there's also a home plus for FHA, VA, and USDA. Somebody was surprised to hear that. They asked me the other day, an agent, well, why would a, a veteran want down payment assistance? They don't have any down payment required. And sure, but you can use the money for closing costs. Uh, and a veteran actually gets a 1% uh, bonus as on top of that for no additional fees or costs on top of that. And a first responder and a teacher, they all get a 1% bonus. So it's, it's a pretty good program. Um, the one we want to talk about a little bit today or not would be the pathway to purchase. If we can go to the next slide and you'll see that uh, we, we call it depleted. However, I'd say it's not quite. Um, according to the website, they're going to be out of money within the next 30 days. And so if you are, have a client that's pre-qualified on this program and you they, this is their only option, um, I would say that you want to have them under contract yesterday or today. Um, and make sure that uh, your your lender is ordering the appraisal on a rush. Uh, you can't. The thing about these programs is you can't reserve the. You have to reserve the funds before you can go to docs and fund it. And you can't reserve the funds typically until fi have final loan approval. And so, it, who knows how many people are out there that are under contract and don't have final loan approval? I'd hate for you to get to the end and find out that there's no money left on this program. Uh, so, Home in Five, Home Plus is uh, potentially a good alternative to that. Uh, pathway to purchase. Keep in mind is conventional. 
Home Plus is conventional. And so on that conventional down payment assistance program, you potentially can do a Fannie Mae loan with 3% down and get a 5% grant. Uh, the grant uh, the interest rate is determined by the amount of the grant on that program. And so you potentially could, if you're buying a house in the low 200s or mid 200s, potentially get enough for your down payment and the closing costs on that program. And that money's forgiven? The money. If they stay there for five years? Well, that's so. pathway to purchase. Okay. On the other programs, you don't have to stay there for any period of time. However, the interest rates are a little bit higher. Okay. That's, how you, that's how you basically pay it back over time. So the money's going bye-bye. The money's going bye-bye. There's a $48 million grant that was given, uh, and you know it's, it's about gone. Just, it is what it is. I mean, the, the other programs run out of money are always refunded on a regular basis. But from what we're hearing, this one probably will not be. Oh, uh, yeah. And if we have any signs of, of what the administration is doing, I'm not looking to see this getting filled up. The coffers getting filled up at all. So, no, exactly. All right. I would guess not. And so there you go. Then there, there, there's our Bookspan Baker team difference. Uh, keep in mind, fully pre underwritten loan packages. Um, I had somebody that needed an answer on Sunday. I contacted my one of my pre approval underwriters, and she logged in and issued a pre call for me because it was a complicated file. So we're here to help uh, 24 7 any way we can. Yeah. And we're going to add another box to the Bookspan Baker team difference uh, K Cups. K cups, machine, absolutely phenomenal. Yeah. All right, Mick, appreciate okay. it. And Thank uh, you. I just remind you, you know, this is a big deal. I mean, I mean, the pathway to purchase uh, disappearing is a is a really big deal for us. And so, I would encourage you while you're at the offices, if you see Mick and and some of your uh, loan officers, Mike and so forth, pop in and stop in and find out and get get the lowdown and find out how to strategize right. and take advantage before the funds are depleted because they will be depleted. You got to just make sure that your client can qualify for home plus because there still is down payment, the good down payment assistant programs out there. There's no question about that. All right, Mick, appreciate it. Thank you very much. All right. So, um, I don't know about you, Todd, but I, from time to time, every once in a while, I go to the mailbox and I get postcards from real estate agents or I get stuff on my door and, and, and so forth. And I know for a lot of, a lot of agents, cause I always ask the question, how many people read them? And everybody says, no, they just throw them away. I read every single one of them. I want to see, uh, I want to see what the competitors are doing. I want to see what the other agents are doing and what messaging and what little trick that they're pulling off. So, so you, Couple that with my marketing background, um, I just tear these to shreds. I've, I've got such a, a a critical eye on these, and so I kind of just go through and and you know this is not good, this is not good. Hey, this is then all of a sudden I get a gem or I get get an idea which I think is really really good. Uh, maybe next week I'll just talk about three ones that I've received recently that I loved. So it got me to thinking um, about what you know when we put together the marketing materials that go in the mail they all look the same they've all got the same message and it's blah 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 so i came up with and i can't really say i came up with this but there are are four things that we need to consider and and to give credit where credit is due i actually got this off a marketing parody video called cat advertising <laughs> and so they called this the you know the four elements of any marketing piece and uh, so of course, it's cats. It's the acronym is PER. But I looked at it. And I thought, boy, this is this is genius because every marketing piece, and this is what I would love everybody to do, is take your most recent marketing piece, write down the acronym, and take a look and ask yourself: Are your marketing pieces answering these four questions? And the first one is: Is your marketing piece persuasive? Mm. Okay, I got one uh, that had no call to action. And then I get a lot of them that say, hey, call me today for my free home evaluation. Okay, well, that's all the other ones do the same thing. So there's no persuasion there. So when you're putting together your marketing piece and you're putting together your content, uh, a lot of us just, you know, just depend on the title companies to, to you know, I had one the other day um, that said just listed and I asked the lady, I said, well, where's the price? There's no price. So so now the consumers have no idea. She goes, well, they're going to – they'll call me for the price. Well, I didn't see any call to action that said call me for the price. There's no persuasion. So so put your – you know, use that as a litme test when, when you put together your marketing pieces. And even you can apply this to all marketing, whether it's social media, videos, whatever the case is. So one, is it persuasive? Is it going to persuade the consumer to do something? The second one, is it unignorable? Um 
is this something, and I do, I get some, and there was one uh, over the holidays this lady sent me, and I just kept reading it. I thought I thought it was phenomenal. I couldn't ignore it. I couldn't put it down. I, w- I kept reading it. It had such phenomenal content, some great call to action, some very, very creative things. And you take a look at the, you know, I mean, right now, try to recall some of your favorite uh, TV commercials or radio commercials, and, and, and immediately certain ones will pop to your mind. And this Sunday, when we all gather around the, the televisions to watch Super Super Bowl. I mean, really, what these marketing firms are trying to do is create sixty-second commercials that you can't ignore, that you're that you're going to remember, and you just can't ignore them because they're so unique. Third one is: is it relevant? Um, is it relevant to your neighborhood? Uh, whatever market, whatever wherever you're canvassing, whatever you're doing, is it is it relevant? Uh, for those of you who have business pages and so forth, if if you're going political right now on them. You got to ask yourself the question: Are your posts relevant to the consumer? Does it is it meeting a need? Are people going to look at it and say, you know what, this applies to me? And that's why you got to be very careful the type of neighborhoods and what marketing uh, materials that you put out, uh, because sometimes the message and and the content in it it's not necessarily relevant to that particular neighborhood. It is not a one size fits all. And then the last one, Todd, is it rememberable? I know that's a new word, uh, but it's actually I looked it up. It's in the Urban Dictionary. Um, is your ad something that is rememberable? Are, that's again, that goes back to the Super Bowl ads. Is it something that people are going to remember? Is it something that people the next day are going to start talking about and, and remember the ad? And so don't do what everybody else is necessarily doing. Don't send out what your title company or your lender just throws at you. Um, that's kind of, you know, for me, and, and I know title companies and lenders will kind of pitch in and, and help with mailing. I don't want it. Because I'm wanting to make my ads about me. I'm branding myself. And, and when I get so much stuff on there, so many logos and so much artwork on there, all of a sudden it's not memorable. People are just going to, you know, uh, it's just another thing and it goes into the trash. Yep, totally. You know, it reminds you, you said well, Super Bowl. And the first thing that came to mind was where's the beef? Oh my you know, it was like, I mean, what a great thing. You know, you're talking about a, a better hamburger than the next company. You know, everybody's talking about reducing their price, adding more fries. Big, You get a big super size and then super duper size and then quadruple super duper 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 super, super size. You know, and then you live in New York and they tell you you can only have a small. But the thing is, is that the, the point is is that the being persuasive is things like you know the five things that could cost you could that could cost smart sellers in in listing their home you know uh, things that that really are persuasive persuasive enough to make people believe that there's a piece or an ingredient that they need to have if they're buying or selling and they don't have it yet and you're purporting to have it that might be a little more persuasive so that's one example that I could think of. Yeah, and and you know, back to the you know one of the things that that I encourage agents to do, you know, something you know as far as being persuasive, uh, you know, and relevant. You know, I'm going back to the example of you know, call me today for your free home evaluation. Okay, first of all, they're not going to call you. Okay, I mean, if they do, good for you. Yeah, you lucked but out. But they're they're they they want to go somewhere. You know, whether it's an email or or go to a website where they can get their home evaluations. But one of the things I challenge agents to do, be different. How about instead of offering a free home evaluation, how about you offer a monthly subscription home valuation? So, wow. so every month now you get emailed a, a, evaluate, a home evaluation Current of your home. Market. Okay, yep. It's different. And that's now that's persuasion. persuasion. Mm-hmm. Okay, I'm going to persuade you to respond to me because I'm not like the other agents. I'm, I'm going to go above and beyond and I'm going to give this to you each and every single month in your inbox. Wow. And and I would say this too. There's a, and we'll, we'll talk about coaching and, and things like that in a little bit. But I think for agents, Todd, especially when it comes down to marketing, we really got to start thinking outside the box. Um, you know, I, I spent a lot of, I spent a great deal of time of people in the marketing industry that that aren't in real estate, of of who you know who's out there. You know, whether it's a marketing firm, a promotions firm, uh, there are people out there that that can coach you. And, and teach you. And sometimes we get stuck in this bubble of, okay, well, it's got to be someone in, in real estate. Marketing's marketing. Right. And I would challenge people. And marketing is one of the most important facets of your business. Of, of Think outside the box. Find some people that you can you can spend a little time and a little money with 
and let them help you put together a a. This is what companies do. They spend yeah. they spend all kinds of money putting together their marketing strategies. What we do is we show up, we see what the next agent's doing, and see what the title company's offering, and boom, there it goes. Well, that just makes us another one, just cookie cutter. Yeah. So Nothing all right. Special. So yep. So that's per per per. Mm-hmm. All right. So uh, make sure your marketing materials are persuasive, unignorable, relevant, and rememberable. And I would also apply this to your elevator pitch. So the next time somebody asks you at the grocery store, "What do you do for a living?" Mm-hmm. Um, I'm a licensed real estate agent. Okay. Well, that's not Good persuading me. It's <laughs> uh, I can ignore that, and it's not very relevant because so is my aunt, uncle, and grandma. Yeah. <laughs> How about I make people's dreams come, come true? true? Yeah. <laughs> All right. So anyways, that's our, our, our three pack, which actually was a four pack today. So going into announcements and going into coaching, um, I uh, want to, for those of you, especially in the Kirlin, Mesa and the Ahwatukee office, we want to invite you to a free lunch and learn this Friday uh, with our, our featured speaker, Coach Kenny Weiss, who is a, uh, he's a per- certified personal coach who, who his story is, is, overwhelming uh just of of the things that he has overcome in his life but his area of specialty and i think it's so um relevant to to uh to real estate agents is is helping us overcome those things that that hold us back from being successful on the telephone for picking up the call calling leads and overcoming some of the things that hold us back uh, when when somebody does ask us what we do for a living or when we're at open houses. And, and I'm amazed for a, a, a lot of times when people ask us what we do for a living. That's the, that's a great question to ask, but then all of a sudden yeah. we kind of get tongue tied. We get in fear. Yeah. And, and, and fear. And, and so he will dig deep. So I want to encourage everybody to come to this. This is going to be a phenomenal event. It will be uh, at our Mesa office upstairs. It is a free lunch and learn. Um, it's a, it's a different thing than what we're normally used to. But really, this is the premise. This is the foundational piece of, of helping us succeed in real estate. So we're going to send you out a link to it. Uh, or you can just, uh, well, we don't have a link to it. So go to um, Mesa at WestUSA.com to register for that. Or you can call the Mesa office and get signed up for that. It's going to be a great time this Friday. And hey, did I mention lunch and ah, learn? You didn't, but you uh, did. Free didn't. lunch. <laughs> Speaking of food, um, so as everybody knows by now, and I'm going to keep hammering on this because everybody keeps telling me that they're going to go, they're going to go, they're going to go, but we're going to come to a point where we're going to run out of cabins. Um, so talked to a lady last, yesterday, and uh, she's her uh, she needs CE hours at, by the end of October, and she's trying to figure out when she's going to go to classes. I said, hey. Let's go on a cruise together and you can get all your CE hours. So September 30th, West USA is setting sail out of Long Beach, California on a seven-day Mexican Riviera cruise uh, hosted by yours truly. I will show you the ways of the buffet table and uh, in the 24-hour room service, uh, things that you need to know about that. But more importantly, the days at sea, you have the opportunity to go ahead and take your CE classes. And by the time you get done with the cruise, you'll walk out and have all your CE hours done for the year. So we're going to send you a link to that. That's just basically going to cruiseforcredit.com. Also, you'll see uh, contact information from a Brett Sponsler there. He is really our, our key guy, and he will answer all of your questions. I think we've we're, we're got about 40 of us ready to go already signed up, but we are going to sell out. So please uh, get signed up for that. And if you do have any questions, you can always email me at webinar at westusa.com. Uh, boy, we're going to talk a about a ton of things, Mike. I know. I know. I know. Well, February 1st, new contract. We're going to talk about the new contract with Jesse Walnick. But uh, if you want some additional training, I encourage you to take a CE class. We've been offering these across the valley. So we've got one more that I'm aware of coming up next Friday, February 10th here at Corporate. Uh, as any, anybody who's ever been in the Larry Hibble class knows, he's a phenomenal instructor. So get signed up for it. Um, I got to tell you, if, if you don't take a CE class on the new contract, Shame on you because, um, you know, I, uh, you know, I asked the question last week to a panel and I said, who benefits more from the new contract, the buyer or the seller? And the answer was, uh, who's ever agent knows the contract better than the other one. That's who benefits. I'm like, duly noted. So get signed up for that. And then lastly, uh, we're going to start some GE, uh, GRI classes here. Um, so go ahead and email us if you're interested in getting your GI designation. Uh, Marge goes 
do a lot of effort, a lot of time in order to provide us with these opportunities at a steeply discounted rate. Uh, so if you do want some more information, go to westusace.com or you can just email me and so forth. So that was a mouthful. My mouth is tired <laughs> um, and I'm getting hungry. So Jesse Walnick from the legal hotline is with us. Jesse, it's been a while. Welcome back to the webinar. And Thank we you. always greatly appreciate uh, your time with us. And so this time around, we don't really have any fancy slides with questions and points. Uh, so we got a, you know 20 minutes to go into just talking about the revised purchase contract. And, and am I accurate by defining it more as a revised purchase contract rather than a new purchase contract? Is it a good term to use? That is a good term to use. Yeah, no, no problems there. I think the focus on that is, um, and I didn't bring my numbers, but there are statistics out from AAR regarding how many times last year alone uh, Realtors used the wrong contract, not the most current contract. It was something like uh, the 2005 contract was used, I think, somewhere around 300 times, and the uh, other uh, older, uh, not older, but um, not the most current contract had been used. I, I can't remember. I think it's a total of like 3,000 times. And if you're using the old one-page contract that's legal size, you know you're doing it wrong, right? <laughs> <laughs> 1994. 1994. Right, right. So yes, agreed. <laughs> Revised. Obviously, um, there's a, a big change. And if you haven't heard, it's coming. We no longer will have a warranted items section. And so I, I teach just a two hour, it's not for credit class, just for people uh, that want to get an update. And so definitely jump, jump into a new contract class that would be beneficial. Probably the biggest topic, of course, is section five regarding warranties. <clears throat> and we don't have warranted items, as I said. So what it says is condition of the property. Buyer and seller agree that it's being sold in its present physical condition, which is the big question. What in the world does present physical condition mean? Well, let's start. Let's backtrack and, and let's, let's build a foundation of why we remove the seller warranties from the purchase contract. Good question. Good point. So if you remember way back when I gave one of my first uh, webinar discussions here, we talked about the contract and warranted items. And I always felt it was problematic. The seller, if they hadn't been properly counseled on what they were agreeing to, was basically signing the contract. And at the same time, they were signing a blank check that just said, whatever you find that is warranted, I agree to repair. And of course, I've had that call on the hotline where buyer was purchasing an older property, put a camera down the sewer line, it was broken, we consider sewer line warranted plumbing, it was a $6,000 repair. And that seller was completely uh, taken aback. They had no idea they had already contractually agreed to make that repair ahead of time before they even knew what the cost was. So I am definitely for the new language present physical condition. But again, if you recall, I said, well, how do you counter warranted items? My recommendations had been sell the property as is. But if you sell a property as is, there is still that stigma. I received a call yesterday on the hotline talking about, can I give a binzer if I have an as is contract? People still have that stigma in their mind that as is means I have no right to inspect the property. And that's not the case. If you look at our as is addendum, it has always said just that 5A of the current contract, not the new one starting tomorrow, but the current contract just does not apply. The seller just said, I'm not agreeing to warranted items, but we still can, of course, look to section 6J and negotiate repairs. And my understanding is as of February 1st, the as is addendum is going bye bye too. Not exactly. They're going to let it remain. I'm start doing my homework, Todd. <laughs> it's going to remain, I think, on uh, right now in the books, it's slated for two weeks because they assume that there could be those carryover contracts from oh, January. Oh, but it is going to go bye-bye. It will eventually go bye-bye. <laughs> you covered, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> um, and that's because, again, present physical condition can be 
similar to as is. Um, again, trying to get away from the terms as is because it just has a negative so, connotation. So basically, as is removed, obviously, the seller warranty. But the very last line of that was always the property has to be in the same condition at the earlier of possession or close of escrow as it was at the time of contract. Exactly. So if that was that's still in there, it always has been, and it's going to remain that way. And that really sums it up. I mean, you know, the condition of the property at the time it's purchased is, is what you're going to get. And, yeah. and the only difference is, is now your inspection isn't to, you know, beat the seller over the head or use it as a tool to, to get out of the contract necessarily, or maybe to, to, uh, you know, get the seller to pay for these uh, items. But it's more of a discovery opportunity for the buyer to make sure that they know what, what they're buying. Absolutely. When you enter into that contract, both sides may not be aware of the condition of the property. Seller often doesn't do an inspection prior to listing. And, you know, that's a tip. That's something that may give you a competitive advantage over other real estate agents. When you go take that listing and you discuss present physical condition, that might be a selling point. Hey, you may want to do a pre-inspection, put that out for the buyer to look at. Of course, we've talked about sharing an inspection and a buyer relying on mm -hmm. it. So that could be problematic. You still want the buyer to get their own home inspection. But, uh, you know, I have had the question in a class before, well, and, and my example trying to relate was, well, what if I go in in the middle of July and I walk into that property, the buyer falls in love with that house. It's the middle of July. What do I know in Arizona? I walked into that house and I didn't think, oh my goodness, it's so hot. That, that meant it was nice and cool in there. The air conditioner was obviously working. I go and do my uh, inspection and now it's not working. A uh, home inspector says air conditioner won't kick on. So somewhere in that time frame, the air conditioner went out. So now how do I prove that the air conditioner was working when I wrote the contract and now it's not working? And the seller in their contract said that or the, the buyer and seller agreed that it was being sold in its present physical condition, which on that day, it was cool inside. So there's going to be small nuances that we just can't address. A contract can't cover every foreseeable issue. It's something to be aware of. I've heard discussion of doing pre-inspections so the seller's aware of any issue they might have. Um, the other big change that goes along with it will be these SPUDs, the Seller Property Disclosure Statement. That now is going to be required within three days of contract. So to me, that marries well with the idea of present physical condition because now, again, people are worried there could be some non-disclosure. The law hasn't changed, folks. The law says, seller, if you're aware of an issue, you must disclose it. And so now, best business practice for you all would be to take uh, that property disclosure statement with you to the listing appointment, have it filled out right away, because if you get a contract, you have a short three-day time frame to get that turned in. You could take the listing and just put the spuds out there on the countertop. Again, I know many agents that would put a binder together, a uh, listing flyer, go to your title company, get their listing packet, put in all those nice fancy graphs, et cetera, and demographics, and then also in that binder, your property disclosure statement. So is there a delivery requirement as far as the SPDS is just concerned? Because I, I understand that, okay, you called for me, so I mailed it, emailed it over to you. There's a section for signature, and most buyer's agents get that incorrect. They think that they're that they're instructing their buyers that they're approving it when they sign it rather than receipt. Exactly. Which is, so I think there's an education curve that needs to happen there. But what do you foresee as any, you know, should, would the who, who bears that responsibility of delivery and acceptance? Uh, for, as far as the spuds, right. it's the same thing. Don't forget, page eight talks about notice. And so with notice, you have to provide the document it, and it gives a list uh, by fax, by email, hand delivery courier. So again, if, recall, I've got an article and I'm not sure if we discussed that here before, but uh, I've written an article. There are some realtors that put their spuds on the MLS under mm -hmm. the document tab. That is not delivery. Right because that notice is not provided as putting it on the internet for you. And there have been those individuals who missed that the SPUDS was in the document tab. So you cannot just assume that putting it on the MLS document tab that it's been delivered. And my understanding that AAR has actually done the unthinkable, something that they've never done in, in the history 
of contract revisions, the bins are actually shrunk by a page. What? They actually made something smaller. Agreed. Because <laughs> it's true, but of course it makes sense. They removed the warranted notice section. So there's no longer a notice. Now it is purely negotiation. And so I don't want folks to get worried that, oh my gosh, this is a contract that totally benefits the buyer. I've heard that comment. It is not. I think the other contract benefited the buyer, my personal opinion, because the seller yeah. often wasn't counseled on what warranted items were. And so now I just think equal footing, it really is, as both of you have said, is a matter of educating and knowing the contract. As the listing agent or the buyer's agent, you should be able to counsel your client. I do think it's going to be a lot of presentation on our part. Here, this is our current contract. The contract says the property will, will be sold in its present physical condition. You absolutely have a right to negotiate repairs. So I don't think it's that dramatic of a change as far as one party gets a benefit over the other. All right. As we uh, continue the discussion with Jesse Wolnick, our uh, our legal hotline attorney, feel free to email us some or uh, text in some questions if you got some questions for her regarding the new contract. Uh, my favorite part of the revisions is the, you know, and, and forgive me, I'm not an attorney, broker, or anything close to that. So I don't know the sections and stuff like that, but I'm looking at it, but it's it's the fixtures mm -hmm. and kind of what we did or not we, what AAR did with, with really kind of getting into uh, listing potential fixtures that convey with the property and as well some sections to to detail the type of appliances that are in the house. Yep. So what they did there, of course, first thing, they alphabetized it, which is helpful. Mm -hmm. um, of course, I get calls all the time on remotes. What if a remote's not there? Do they have to provide it? No, nothing has changed there. The contract has always said those items that are existing, here's a list of what must remain. And again, mm -hmm. I always make a distinction. What's a fixture versus personal property? A, a basic uh, rule of thumb. A fixture, if you need a tool to remove it, it's probably a fixture. Check with your broker, but that's always a good rule of thumb. Uh, a common call I get, a lot of folks remodeling their bathroom, hang a pretty mirror on the wall. Buyer does the final walkthrough, everything looks great. They go to move in, the mirror is gone and they're very upset. Most buyers are not walking through checking to see if each mirror is attached to the wall. That's an education process. Listing agents, when you take a listing, you should say, let's walk from the front door and go through the house. Make any note of things that you know are not working or you do not want to convey. Let me know of any issues in the house and just walk room to room. When you get to the bathroom, say, are those mirrors attached? Obviously, you can tell in most cases, but if it has a pretty frame around it, that's the first clue. It may not be attached. Now, I've actually recently heard stories where people are actually going like and removing trees and boulders. And, and I mean, I, I think if it yeah. needs a bulldozer or a backhoe, <laughs> it, I'm just saying, I'm thinking that it probably should convey. Again, you know, you know it's kind of funny. I, I was looking at the new contract and, and you know, you know how flat panel TVs ever since like the old satellite dishes have become an issue, you know, are, does it stay? Does it not? Those things are heavy, right? The big 75 inch babies. Well, you know, the thing is, okay, the TV can go, that's personal property. But the but the bracket has to stay. Exactly. Well, what happens if somebody you, you bought this seventy five inch TV? Somebody's going to put up a thirty two inch. Yeah. You know what? Negotiate it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, and that's the key. When in doubt, disclose. Yeah. Or when in doubt, ask. Um, again, I give an example of uh, a horse arena. Folks out there who are horse people know that you can lease these. Uh, large horse area. Uh, it's like a pen or something. They call it an arena, I think. And so a tenant was living in a property. He had a horse arena. Buyer saw it and thought, great, we've got an arena. Buyer goes to move in. The arena's gone. It was the tenants. Seller cannot convey what they don't own. So ask mm -hmm. for those things that are wow. important. Mm -hmm. And so if you see a large potted tree, you should ask. But the new fixtures and personal property does say outdoor landscaping, trees, and unpotted plants. In other words, if it's in the ground, it should stay. If it's in a pot, it likely may go. No even if there's, the exactly, even if there's a water drip line in there, all you have to do is pull the water drip line out. There's no tool involved to remove it. So again, good rule of thumb, if a tool is required, it likely will fall under fixture. And so we also added some lines in there as far as, because I, I know the biggest, or not the biggest, but but a common scenario is uh, buyer, you know, purchases the house, walks through the house, notices all the stainless steel appliances in the kitchen, and, 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 and it even says that the 
the refrigerator conveys. Then when they move in, there's a small little tiny white refrigerator. Um, and so there's a swapping of the appliances. And so the, the revised purchase contract allows for us to write in a little more detail. And I always advise through all of this, take pictures of everything in the house if you're representing the buyer. Yeah, I mean, everything with a grain of salt, I can tell you that well, actually that you would think might be backfired on me, right? Oh. I remember showing property years ago as a new agent, and I was taught in real estate school, get there the number or take a picture, but it was the very first house. And by the end of the day, we had viewed, I don't even recall how many, and they said, house number one, we love it. And as a brand new agent, I'm thinking, well, let's go back, view it one more time, make sure I'll grab the numbers at that time. I called the agent, listing agent said, hey, heads up, we're heading over. Can I show it again? Agent said, yes. I said, likely we're going to be presenting an offer. I'm giving her a heads up. Hey, hold off on accepting anything. I'm coming over with an offer. Get to the door and we're stopped because the listing agent has presented another offer that she double dipped. So I went to get numbers and it was again used against me. Bottom line is, yes, if, you're, if your client shows any interest, right, yeah. take photos. That's your best bet. Biggest call I get is the listing does disclose. Again, you have a duty. You should disclose. You have to have a mutual agreement to have contract. Uh, the, con the garage has the, the black GE uh, refrigerator, and in the kitchen is the nice Viking steel. stainless steel. And it says on the listing, garage refrigerator conveys. and then. When they move out and the garage refrigerator is put into the kitchen, the buyer balks and says, no, no, I thought I was buying that Viking uh, refrigerator in the kitchen. So again, agents, you all have a duty to make sure that the terms are clearly written in the contract. Buyer's agent should have written that in, but at the very least, listing agent should have put that in to make sure everybody was clear what refrigerator conveyed. So, so years ago, we were also taught method of, of attachment was also if a something was made to fit a particular niche, um, and yet that niche was not a, here we go again, standard sized opening because, you know, you got the stoves. Remember the stove issue, Mike, you, I think you remember that too. You know, it's one of those situations, standard 31 and a half inch width, right? You take the, they take the stove because it's personal property. It's not a fixed, it's plugged in, you know, yada, yada. But, you know, again, if there's something, the, the biggest rule of thumb, I think, and, and I'm surprised they even still left all that in there, but I know they need to uh, just to kind of give everybody a heads up. But it, it, the real rule of thumb here for, all of our agents to understand is is I don't care if it says that it's a pers a, a fixture and you look at it and it's a fixture. If your client's got any interest in having that item remain past the close of escrow, it behooves you as a great standard of practice to write it down anyway. Absolutely, I recall presenting an offer to my seller and the buyer asked for the fake pink ficus tree in her dining room, and we had the best laugh. But that tree stayed. We agreed to that. So everything matters. Yeah, you yeah. should. If it, if it's material to you, you should confirm it in your contract. Yeah. All right. So we got time for my one more of your favorite sections that you want to highlight. Yeah. What do you got for us? Well, actually, two B section two B of the contract to me is one of the biggest calls I get, and that is the loan contingency section. So many folks are confused, and I always like to draw the distinction. That loan contingency section is confusing. I agree. There is a difference between a contingency and a breach of contract. A contingency, remember, is a condition precedent. If this doesn't happen, then we have no agreement. There is no breach with a contingency. A certain requirement must be met before we proceed. So if that requirement isn't met, we just cancel the contract. There is no cure notice. And so Section 2B, in my opinion, is uh, a, a mesh of both a contingency and a contractual requirement. So they've tried to clarify that three days prior to close of escrow, the buyer must do one of three things. Now that we haven't changed. It says you must either sign all loan documents, deliver to seller or escrow company notice of loan approval without PTD conditions and your closing disclosures received, or number three, deliver to seller your inability to obtain loan approval. I get the call so frequently on the hotline, well, they didn't do one of those three things, so we don't have a contract. Is that correct? Because it says loan contingency as a clause. That is not correct. The loan contingency is buyer must receive approval on the loan to proceed. If we don't have approval, the contingency wasn't met. 
The items I spoke are a requirement of the contract. Buyer, you must do one of three things. If the buyer didn't do one of those three things, then seller, you must give a cure notice. Mm -hmm. Now we've got a breach in the contract. And so it does state that under Section 2C, they've added language. If the buyer fails to deliver notice, seller may issue a cure notice to the buyer. They've tried to make that distinction. Or just because it says loan contingency uh, doesn't mean it's, in fact, a contingency. It's not an automatic cancellation. It's still a contract requirement. Buyer, you do one of these three things. If not, seller, you may send a cure notice. So I think that was really important. I get that call all the time. It's a very misunderstood clause of the contract. All right. So uh, how much confusion do you foresee? Immediate. I'm crossing my fingers. I hope none, but we shall see. All right. So again, I encourage everybody to go to westusace.com. Uh, I know we got at least one more uh, CE class coming up that's going to talk about the new contracts. So not only are you going to get your CE hours, but uh, you don't owe it to yourself to take the class, but you do owe it to your consumers to take the class because um, the the agent I, I foresee in the first 30 days, the agent that is aware and more familiar with the revisions mm -hmm. will have the added advantage for their client uh, over the agent that does it. I've taken one and it's, you know, it. I tell you, you know, I mean, your initial response, oh, my gosh, you're going to get rid of the seller warranties is it's going to create all kinds of chaos. But it makes sense. And and I foresee it being, you know, as an agent, it'd be such a, a, a smoother, um, smoother way of doing real estate. So moving right along, and we're going to we're going to keep Jesse here because Bob likes to keep her around because Bob likes to get educated every once in a while. That's why we got Jesse here, Bob. Wonderful. <laughs> but I uh, want to encourage everybody. We're up to, I think last check, we were up to 600 of our agents responding to our annual West USA survey. So for those of you that have done that, we greatly appreciate that. Uh, we want to get as many of you, we love all of you to respond to it. It is your opportunity to, um, to let us know how we're doing in the effort to help us improve and provide better services. Some of you might have taken a little bit of liberty and lost all tact and respect in some of your responses. And please understand we read them. And <laughs> uh, and this is just an, an, something that we do because we wanna provide you better services. So please refrain, just uh, be constructive with it. But regardless, uh, you have, should have received multiple emails from us with the link. We wanna encourage you, it takes a couple minutes answer the questions, anything that you think that would help us uh, better your business. But with that, we're giving away uh, like $450 in in gas cards. Uh, so this will be the first year that I'm not going to win one of them. So uh, I'm just kidding. But prize number one is a $250 gas card. It's prize number two, $150. And the third one's a $50. $250 a in long gas. Way. That's a month. Oh, my gosh. That would, uh, that would pay for uh, – about three days of Bob's commute from Maricopa up here to the corporate office. So uh, just about, just about. So please, uh, uh, you you get entered in the in the drawing just for completing the survey. So we please ask and encourage that you do so. All right, Bob, uh, don't do that. What's uh, what are agents doing to cause you grief at night? Well, here's an interesting one. Let's see what you think. It's right here. It's on my phone. It said. Uh, this uh, our agent has a buyer and she says uh, it's going to close in a couple of weeks 13 days i think something like that but the uh, the buyer just went into hospice now i don't know what that means too much but uh, should i disclose that to the seller what do you think jesse Possibly. I think it depends on what that means. Hospice usually means they're well, at the end of their... You're not a doctor, right? neither am I. Right. Agreed. But there could be the issue that they may be at the end of their life cycle. And if that's the case, the requirement legally is that the buyer's estate would still be required to close escrow. However, mm -hmm. if the buyer can no longer qualify for the loan they could issue an unfulfilled loan contingency. So I think your agent needs to ask a few more questions. 
is this a cash deal? If it's a cash deal, there should be no effect. You they're may getting, not have to disclose, loan on right? Because the the transaction would go forward anyhow. But if the buyer's yeah. in hospice and they no longer can qualify for a loan, then you probably should disclose that. That will be well, material. They no longer qualify, yeah. But I believe they they can, and uh, if if she would expire before the end of this period, well, then the um, the rest of the people, the family, the whole deal, they're moving in together or something. So it's 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 one of those things, if you tell the seller, then the seller starts making up their own stories. They're not doctors, but they will uh, make it a little bit different, I wonder. Maybe not. It's it's uh, just one of, one of those crazy questions I got just before I came upstairs here. All right. Here, here's one I got that uh, it worked out uh, pretty well. We, we've got an agent that had some commission due, a little uh, rental commission, and he couldn't seem to get it. But anyway, he was told to uh, file for, in small claims court for his rental commission. And uh, he somehow or another got a hold of me. There was two people that told him to do this, and he got a hold of me. And first of all, it's not his commission. He can't file in small claims court for it since the commission belongs to the dude sitting over here. <laughs> so if anybody files in small claims court, it would have to be Dale. So it was, it was interesting. So I, I just called up the broker. He says, oh, I'll see if I can fix that for you. And Within a couple, three days, here comes our $522, just that quick. So don't listen to other people. Give a call to the broker here, and I think we can help you out in most cases. That was a, that was an interesting one. And, and this one comes up at least twice a day. Agent wants to give away their commission. So sometimes I wonder why they get in the business if they're going to give it away. Uh, yeah, you're you're no, laughing no, no, over no, here, no. Dale. They're only giving away Dale's commission. I thought <laughs> Dale's commission. <laughs> well, they got this one fellow yesterday got all kinds of advice from the title company and the mortgage company and all kinds of stuff. I said, wait a minute. First of all, it isn't your money, so don't go running around like that. Call us and we will decide. And actually, I've got something called an A one forty eight form wrote that many years ago, commission reduction. And you can have this thing signed by who? The broker. And he'll allow, in this case, yes, it was just $500 they wanted to give to the buyer to finish up uh, a situation here. And that was okay. But I get at least two or three of these a day. They're wanting to give away the money. You've got to go into the A forms to A148. There it is. Commission reduction. Get Dale to sign it and Bam, you're into it. Okay. And another one, somebody wanted to write a contract on something that wasn't in the MLS. There's another broker involved there. Well, we do have a commission co-broker agreement in lieu of a cooperative multiple listing entry. In lieu of that, we don't have one. So let's get a commission co-broker agreement. Here it is, A132. I get that quite often. Uh, you don't want to write a contract on somebody's listing unless you have that agreement to pay you. That's why you're out there to get paid. Sometimes the buyer will pay you. Nah, not likely. <laughs> and of course, uh, the other one was is in the zip forms called unrepresented seller, and I'm getting a bunch of those. A bunch of those people are. Uh, are fizzboing their houses and whatnot, unrepresented seller compensation agreement. And I had one that just fell through the other day. And so they said, shall we write a whole new contract? Well, if it fell through, then there is nothing. Yes, write a whole new contract. Go get a new unrepresented seller compensation agreement and let's get it on. She says immediately, sir, thank you very much. And she took off and started to do that. Oh, one of the guys called up the other day and said, you know, I've got a, a deed that went from one person to another person. Is that valid? Yeah, 
it's valid. Well, it wasn't recorded. Well, what is recording? And uh, I've got it written here. Recording is constructive notice, but a deed from one person to another is okay. Would that be correct, Jesse? I would say it would have to be notarized, though, right? Well, it's notarized. Okay. Yes. I would say in Arizona, because we're a lien theory, we're a lien theory state, that so it has to be actually recorded with a with a tax with the uh, assessor's office. The uh, uh, but in order because if it's not just because you have the document in your pocket, that would be like a title theory state. I'm going to go with Jesse's answer. Jesse, <laughs> a deed recorded, or a deed conveying one a property from one person to another technically does not have to be recorded to be valid. However, if a subsequent purchaser purchases, now we've got an issue and it may not. So in other words, I, I wrote an article about this where Bob conveys a, de a deed to me and I never record it. And then he turns around and conveys the property a few years later to Mike. Mike was a subsequent purchaser he may have been harmed because I never recorded. It gets a little complicated. Bottom line, Bob's correct. It doesn't have to be recorded to be valid, but if a subsequent purchaser pops up, now you've got issues, consult an attorney. As a matter of fact, and you should be proud of me on this, I checked into Black's Law Dictionary to make sure that I was correct about that, but I had to uh, advise one of the agents. He was having a little issue there with IRS. And I'm, I'll go, don't tell them I said so, though. <laughs> then th this thing right here that I have, I showed it to you a little while ago. Um, here's somebody has sent over a, a cure notice. And here, here's the cure. The following noncompliance with the contract. Escrow not opened. Is that non-compliance with a contract? Hmm. That's not in the contract. It doesn't tell you you have to open escrow at a certain date. You are going to open escrow, of course, but not a certain date. So it's not uh, uh, something you send a cure notice on you. The issue here was the earnest money wasn't in escrow, and they should have said no earnest money. Then they would have been correct. So another one of those things that came down. And then I uh, next thing I got here is all this uh, contract stuff. Man, oh man, it's going to be wonderful to have that. But there's a bunch of ancillary forms that are coming out with that. And that everything like multiple offer, counter offer, short sale addendum, critical date list, all this stuff is coming out. And it will have some mild very mild changes in some of this stuff. So um, we, we hope that gets out soon. And so make sure that you're using the very latest forms on all of this stuff. Then I had, uh, and I sent this out. I don't, I don't know if I spoke of this last week. I don't think I did. I think I talked about this over in Mesa. Uh, contracts don't cover everything says uh, questions that need to be addressed in the offer. Is 10 days enough to do all the inspections? I've never believed that 10 days covers it. Usually we get it done in 10 days, but wait a minute. What if something comes up here and I, I, maybe 15 might be better? And they considered doing 15, didn't they, Jesse? They did, and I was a little excited about that, but I, I, I don't know the discussion and why uh, 10 days prevailed, but it's the same as always. If you come upon an issue, I always encourage scheduling your inspection as soon as possible. I probably, with this new contract, might wait those three days and get my seller property disclosure statement first. If it's late, just proceed, get your inspection started. If I end up with a roof issue or a major plumbing issue and I want to further investigate that, yes. I need to extend by an addendum. If I don't have that, there's no verbal agreement to extend. Now, if, uh, if I don't get the, um, the spuds within the three days, wouldn't I want to cure them? You would cure them. Yes, that is a contract breach. And then during the, those, during the time that it takes for them to respond during the cure notice, wouldn't that extend? Doesn't that suspend the inspection period? 
No, our contract says buyer has a right to disapprove of items in the spuds uh, within five days of receipt. Okay. Yep. And then it says here, should a buyer have a sewer inspection done with a camera inserted in the pipes? Yeah, it sounds good unless it's a new house. Uh, I bought a new house the other day. Congratulations. And uh, so I won't have to drive from Maricopa anymore when I get this sucker built. Uh, But uh, I'm not going to have the camera put down in the pipes because I believe that it'll be all right. But an older house with roots and stuff growing around, do that. Here's another one. If the home has a gas furnace with a heat exchanger, do you know about heat exchangers? Check with your inspector because there was a lot of heat exchangers that agents were buying over the years. So make sure you know what that is. Talk to your inspector. And then there's always a termite inspection. It used to be a big deal. It isn't anymore. The, uh, it was required on every contract, but it's different now. So make sure you get that termite inspection. You want to know. Um, well, pretty much with the, the three gentlemen here on the webinar each and every Tuesday morning, there's a lot of heat exchanging <laughs> as we uh, just obliviate or obliviate and, and talk and, and blah, blah, blah. But anyways, and nonetheless, uh, Bob, appreciate it. Todd, appreciate it. And Jesse, appreciate it. And if you'd like some more information on where you can read some of Jesse's articles, we highly encourage you to go to aaronline.com. Go to the Managed Risk Legal Hotline section uh, and uh, educate yourself. So appreciate it. Leave you with the quote of the day from the great Albert Einstein. The only source of knowledge is experience. Appreciate you joining us today, folks, and go out and sell a home.